Uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the tenth meeting of the Holiday Devolution Committee in the Scottish Parliament. Um, just remind everybody to <coughs> switch off their mobile phones. Also, mention that Mark Macdonald will join us um, during the proceedings of the morning. He's currently at Finance Committee, um, where I understand the Chief Secretary is giving evidence. Uh, welcome to our panel this morning. Um, we have John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution, and Economy from the Scottish Government, obviously. Um, we've got Sean Neill, who's the Deputy Director of Finance, and Gerald Byrne, who's the Scotland Bill team leader, to support him. Um, Deputy First Minister, I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate we're tight for time this morning, um, but we'll, I'll sort of try to, everybody can keep their questions as tight as they can and the answers as tight as we can. In the meantime, do you wish to make a short opening statement? If, uh, the, what I would just like to say to the committee is that obviously with the agreement of the fiscal framework last week, which uh, I appeared before the committee shortly before we were able to conclude the negotiations on the fiscal framework, so some of the ground we have covered already, but I'm very happy to cover that again today. But obviously in the light of the agreement of the fiscal framework last Tuesday, uh, the government has now been able to uh, submit to Parliament a revised legislative consent memorandum in, in which the, the Government makes it clear that we are able to make a formal recommendation to Parliament that it consents to the Scotland Bill completing its parliamentary stages. And um, obviously in the course of the uh, period that lies ahead we will submit a motion to Parliament that enables <coughs> Parliament to consider that question once the Committee has uh, completed its scrutiny. Um, obviously, on issues in relation to the Scotland Bill and the Fiscal Framework, I'm very happy to answer questions from the committee this morning. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming before us this morning. It was a rather fast-moving day the last time you appeared before us. It was ended in quite a remarkable end. Um, but during the process, Deputy First Minister, you've been pretty consistent in stressing the importance of the Parliament being able to scrutinise the Fiscal Framework. You previously stated in writing to the committee you intend to publish the key documents on the fiscal framework to support the process. I just, it would be useful to hear from you what, what, do you, what you envisage these key documents are. Um, do you still intend publishing them? And then are there any factors outside your own control, outside pressures that, would, that wouldn't enable you to publish these documents? Kavina, the, obviously the key document in, in this respect is the agreement which is now before um, Parliament and able to be scrutinised by members and we are uh, currently working with the Treasury on the supporting technical information that would support that but I would essentially um, point the committee towards the agreement as the, um, the document that encapsulates the ground that we have covered in the negotiations and the conclusions that we have arrived at. Now, obviously, there are a whole range of documents that have been um, part of that process. Um, I would like to be in a position to publish um, as many of those key documents as I possibly can do. Uh, obviously, there will be some documents in which I need to liaise with uh, the Treasury about as to whether they are content for those to be published into the bargain. Um, but I am actively exploring and discussing with the Treasury what documents we can publish to further enhance the scrutiny the committee is able to undertake in this process. And do we have any f feeling at this stage of the sort of time scale that these documents will become available? I think that has to be done timorously, convener of the committee. I am aware of the time scales under which the committee is operating. So if the committee wishes to consider any of these documents as part of the scrutiny process, then obviously that information will have to be available very swiftly. So uh, I am working very much within that context to try to publish material as soon as is practically possible. And obviously some of the stuff that underpins the heads of agreement is the technical agreement area um, and that will be much more complex and full of no doubt algebraic formula in some sort but it, nevertheless it will be important that that stuff becomes available for particularly for the committees of this parliament and outside commentators to understand what the actual detail is. Have you got a feel for when that might be Published. Again, I would, I, I, I would like to see that uh, done as soon as possible. Um, I think I, I would caution the committee about um, the sense that there's any new ground going to be covered in the technical documents. There will certainly be more detail in the technical documents, but the, the, the substance of the agreement is encapsulated in the document that was published last Thursday evening, um, jointly by the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom government, and it captures um, essentially the, uh, the details of the agreement that we have put in place. 
Okay. Just on the general transparency issues, I'll just follow that theme through. Obviously, the fiscal framework makes reference to a number of range of processes and procedures that need to be in place, including things like the independent review process, the audit reports, the method methodology of assignment of VAT, revised member of understanding, member of understanding between um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission and OBR, uh, and obviously that operational governance issues behind it. Um, and, and these things will be ongoing processes. Uh, I just wonder what discussions the Treasury and the Scottish Government have had about making sure that as, as this process unfolds, that the appropriate committees in the Parliament are kept up to speed on what's going on. I think all of those um, documents to which you refer, Convener, are documents that are material to the transparency and scrutiny process. So I think they have to be in the public domain. And um, the, um, as I've tried to do in this process around the fiscal framework, um, and as I conceded to the committee, I've, I would be the first to acknowledge that it has not been perfect, that uh, I've not been able to be as open with the committee as I would have liked to have been. Um, I think those, um, those documents are um, more easy to make available to committees as part of the ongoing scrutiny process of the fiscal arrangements that will have to exist to underpin the uh, implementation of the Scotland Bill. I think probably the natural place to go at this stage would be to Stuart. Can I just you, follow up yeah, sure, on, the, on the information that could and should be made available? I think um, the committee itself was very considerate in, in, in its initial response that during the process of negotiation, uh, it would be difficult to give a running commentary. But we are now at a different stage. I think everybody would agree. We've had warm words from Mr Mundell and, and, and indeed the Scottish Government about wanting to provide that full disclosure. Um, I don't think that's simply for the committee. Some of the evidence that we've had in the last couple of days uh, from academics, from interest groups, want to understand uh, the, the detail, not simply the heads of agreement, uh, agreement which, uh, as I would understand it, the, are the principles uh, which, which have been agreed and that we go forward. Um, Mr Mundell and uh, Mr Hans are here today. Uh, do, uh, are you planning to meet them when they're here today? Uh, if there's anything scheduled in? I have no plans to meet them today. But no. they are here, and if there is any obstacles um, uh, about uh, you suggested that there may be obstacles and uh, not agreement to disclose the information uh, are the key documents. Can we, can we, can we, we will put this question to them as well. Can we get you all together while you are in this building today and, and, and ask you to deliver which we, the, 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 the key documentation uh, that has been hinted at, has been promised, um, the, the, you certainly have a will to provide that information. Can we clear this up today and provide this to the committees of this parliament? As, I, as, I, as I've said uh, publicly, Kavira, I'd be happy to um, set out the key documents that are involved in this process. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, I'm, it's not my business to um, point the committee into any questioning that it may undertake, but it's a, it's a very legitimate issue to, to raise with myself. Well, what are well, the obstacles? Well, Let's I, clear well, the I, way and get it done. Well, well exactly. I, I, as I say, I, I have no plans to meet um, the Chief Secretary today. Um, we had looked at the possibility of meeting today, but just in terms of uh, the parliamentary commitments that I have today and that Mr Hans has in terms of committee appearances and his travel arrangements, I don't think it's literally physically possible for us to, to meet today, given the amount of time. It may depend on how long the committees of parliament uh, detain Mr Hans today, but um, the, certainly for the, 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 we, we were unable to arrange a practical, physical opportunity for us to meet. But uh, you know, as I say to the committee, I'm, I'm very happy to publish the key documents and I'm trying to, uh, to, to secure the necessary agreement to enable well, me to do so. Well, I suppose the, the finishing remark is, is publishing be damned then? Well, it may well come to that, Mr Minion. Thank you. <laughs> I think you've given us a good pointer about where our questions need to be um, focused in the next session we have. I think that probably the right place to go at that stage is because just to keep in the area of um, transparency is to go to the review process issues later first. So Stuart Maxwell. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Convener. Um, Deputy First Minister, I 
appreciate it, I think, if you were able to lay out your understanding, um, or rather the Scottish Government's understanding, of what has been agreed in terms of the, 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 the first five years um, leading up to the review post, and then the actual review process itself, what will take place and what the arrangements will be, uh, firstly, if there is an agreement at that point, and secondly, uh, if unfortunately there is not an agreement, what, what you expect to happen? In the, the delivery of the commitments around uh, block grant adjustment, the, uh, in the period between now and 2022, uh, the agreement sets out at um, sections uh, 15 to 19. The uh, exercise of, that, will be, that will be undertaken to undertake the block grant adjustment Essentially, the, um, and the key paragraph in this respect is paragraph 17, um, where the United Kingdom government's comparability model will be run. Um, it will produce an outcome um, which will be reconciled to the outcome that would have been delivered with per capita index deduction, which is the model which I had advanced in the negotiations. So when we strip out all of the text, fundamentally the outcome that has to be delivered is per capita index deduction and delivered on an annual basis and that is secured by this agreement up until 2022. When it comes to the point of review, um, after the 2021 Scottish parliamentary elections um, there will be an independent review commissioned, uh, an independent report commissioned by both governments, so that will be commissioned jointly by both governments both governments will have to consent to who will be undertaking that independent report and how that will be undertaken. It will report to both governments at the same time and both governments will then consider that report and um, by, the, by 20, the end of the financial year 21-22, um, both governments will have to agree um, what steps to take forward as a consequence of the receipt of that report and the review that is undertaken. And that requires agreement on the part of both governments at that time. The obligation of the agreement um, that has been reached is that both um, governments have got to come to an agreement at that stage and that's what we will endeavour to do. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, if, however, I'm just, I'm just want to be clear here though. If, um, given the uh, review, we'll have to conclude, as I understand it, by the end of 20, the calendar year 2021, and the uh, intention is that both governments will come to an agreement by the end of the financial year 21-22, effectively that's a period of roughly three months, um, 12 weeks. If that agreement cannot be reached within that 12-week period, is it the case that the, the, what is then the status quo, which you've just laid out, you know, the no detriment model that you just laid out, um, will that carry on beyond uh, that 12-week that period until such time as both governments have come to a, an agreement? A reasonable conclusion. Is that the actual agreement that's been, been, been agreed well, between the, the two? The, the, there, is, uh, you, there is no... Um, uh, there is no prejudging of that agreement process that is undertaken at 2022. Just for, again for clarity, um, is it possible, um, in your view, for one or other of the governments to withdraw from that agreement effectively? Um, is it the case that it will just carry on automatically, or will, could, for example, if there's no agreement reached, the UK government could say, well, we've had enough and we're going to go ahead with a, a new model? That, not, could not happen. that could not happen. That could not happen because the agreement at Clause 23 says the two governments will jointly agree that that method as part of the review. Um, I, sorry, I'll, 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 forgive me, I'll give the whole sentence, uh, the whole paragraph in 23. The fiscal framework does not include or assume the method for adjusting the block grant beyond the transitional period. The two governments will jointly agree that method as part of the review. The method... A, adopted will deliver results consistent with the Smith Commission's recommendations including the principles of no detriment, taxpayer fairness and economic responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Alec? Yes. Uh, the cynical uh, might say that one of the conveniences of this arrangement is it kicks the whole issue well into the future, well into the long grass, so to speak. The, however, uh, am I right in thinking that we will have the relevant figures for both methodologies available to us on an annual basis 
uh, so that we can draw comparisons as the years go by? The first thing I would say, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely stunned that Mr Johnson is descending into cynicism. <laughs> stunned. Um, but aside from that, once I've recovered from that, um, I, this has not been kicked into the long grass. This is the mechanism that will adjust the block mm. grant. But the, when these, when what these, I, what these I mean is the decision in. has been no, no, but moved. I think, but, but I, think it's, I think it's really important that we don't just glide past the next few years. We have in place a mechanism which will, which will deliver the Smith principle of no detriment and will ensure that the Scottish budget is not a penny worse off than it would have been had these powers mm -hmm. not been devolved. And that's a very, very significant uh, assurance and guarantee for the people of Scotland. So that's in place, and it's in place up until 2022. What the Smith Commission report envisaged, and um, th there are other provisions within the fiscal agreement uh, later on at um, sections uh, 111 onwards, where the, the, the concept of further review of fiscal arrangements was put in place, was recommended by the Smith Commission and has been put into practice in the fiscal framework. Now, what, um, what the Smith Commission recommended was that we shouldn't be you know, in constant revision mode on this type of agreement. What we should do is have in place agreements that were reviewed over a longer period of time. And that's why the review mechanism is compatible with the thinking of the Smith Commission report. Um, being less cynical, uh, my concern is that we're in a position where we may, uh, at the end of that three-month period that we just described, find ourselves in a similar position to the one we were in uh, last Tuesday where negotiations go down to the wire. Are you confident, firstly, that understanding will grow and that when we get into the mechanism described, uh, we'll be in a much more informed uh, and uh, proactive environment? And are you confident that the mechanism which you set out will not create a situation like the one we had last Tuesday where it all goes down to the wire again? The first thing is, I apologise to Mr Johnson, I didn't answer his final question in his first question, which was, will the annual information be available? Mm -hmm. And yes, there will be an output from the comparability model um, that will show the information that it shows and the uh, an, uh, an analysis from the per capita index deduction model, and it's the per capita index mm -hmm. deduction model that will, that will drive our budget. So that information will be available mm -hmm. on an annual basis for, for scrutiny. And that, of course, will inform the process. We will have a period of data that will get us to 2022, mm -hmm. which will enable that to be part of the review. I, I certainly cannot rule out that discussions will go down to the wire. Most things, in my experience in this type of negotiation, do tend to go to the wire. Um, the fact that we have a relatively short window between the completion of the independent report at the end of 20, calendar year 2021 and the necessity for the review to be resolved by the end of the, the, the end of the financial year 21-22 in March 2022 places an obligation on both governments to come to an agreement and of course uh, public expenditure will be driven by these decisions so it's important mm. that we have assurance in place that enables us to uh, plan and predict public expenditure in the light of that uh, in the light of that agreement thank you very much Tavis Scott Two brief supplementaries. The first on the point, um, you, Deputy First Minister, you just made to Mr Johnson on the data to be published on an annual basis. Does that mean that comparable expenditure per capita on devolved services for Scotland and the rest of the UK will be published on an annual basis so that we might understand that detail? I would think that on the, the PISA statistics probably provide that already, I would think, but I, I, I would perhaps I'm Perhaps I'd better just write to the committee to confirm that. Sure. But, I'm pretty, but I'm pretty sure the PISA statistics will give that information already. But what, what this process will certainly um, identify is what, the, what would have been generated by the application of the comparability model and what would be generated by per capita index deduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure the clarity would be helpful on that. And, f and the second question, I, I still don't understand, um, to be blunt, uh, what... what actual model is now being used because 
uh, I very strongly supported the approach that you and your government took in relation to what I'm going to loosely describe as the Scottish model. And um, if I read Clause 23 that you've already uh, discussed with Mr Maxwell, it seems to me that the default position there is whatever model we now have. Now, I totally take your point that you know, there's no financial detriment whatsoever, but the mechanism strikes to me as quite important. So what model is it that is now in place in this agreement? The, 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 the relevant clause is number 17, which sets out that um, we, the, the, the block grant adjustment for tax should be affected by using the comparable model Scotland share while achieving the outcome delivered by the index per capita model uh, method for tax and welfare. Is, and is that an amalgamation of both, or am I being just stupid about this? I think that it would, <laughs> well, it's an amal essentially it is the, 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 the treasury model is being run, yeah. but it's got to deliver the that's outcome right. that right. is delivered by per capita that's index deduction. Yeah. So the key, yeah. the key point, and this is why, and I think in the interest of trying to be absolutely crystal clear about this, the reason why the government is, when I came to this committee last Tuesday morning, I said to the committee, Everything else was sorted out mm. apart from the block grant adjustment. Mm. Mm. And in the course of Tuesday, we got to an agreement whereby what we were able to secure was the outcome of per capita index deduction. And that's what enabled the government to sign the fiscal framework. No, I understand that. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. It would be interesting to ask Mr Hans to explain what this comparable method is and how it differs from an outcome from the per capita index reduction. That's up to us to ask these questions, obviously. But on, on, that, on these same issues, obviously there's going to be an independent body that will look at all of this as, as it comes to the review period. Has there been any decision yet on how, how they'll appoint these independent advisors? Um, there's been no discussion on that question, Kavira. We've, we've obviously concentrated on getting the agreement in place, having it published uh, in a timorous way so that both this committee and the Scottish Parliament and the House of Lords can explore and examine these issues and um, we, we will obviously in due course uh, address these questions. And to, obviously I'm, I'm assuming from the tenor agreement that wh 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 whoever these advisors were they ought to be agreed jointly with ourselves and the, and the UK government. Uh, yes, the, 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 the provision um, is, is that the, um, the, the, the review has got to be put in place by agreement between both governments. Okay, one, one other question before I come to Malcolm Chisholm, just to make sure I finish this area off. You've already said to others that we'll obviously the Scottish Parliament and its committees will see the appropriate documentation as we go through the process. Can we, be, can we also have the assurance that, that when we come to having that independent report, it will be put also before the Scottish Parliament for scrutiny at the appropriate time? Yeah, I, I think that process um, will require to be um, entirely transparent utterly and totally transparent um, because um, it's not a negotiated, to go back to the question that Mr McNeill asked me earlier on, it is not, that is not a negotiated process. That is a process of inquiry and research which I think for the benefit of public information and public debate um, should be um, a, an entirely transparent process. So both governments have agreed what, what would be published and how it would be published I didn't, is, there I, a, is, is there an agreement there with, the, no, with, no, with both governments? No. There's no, I, I'm simply I'm proffering uh, my opinion about what should be required there. There's and, not and, agreement and, yet. There's no agreement yet, but I'm making the distinction between the point that Mr McNeill was asking me, was raising earlier on, uh -huh. which was a, a helpful acknowledgement that in a negotiation between two governments, it is difficult to provide a running commentary on these questions. But when you have an independent review process, I think it is much more practical and possible to have a more transparent process. Okay, one final one, just to make sure we tie this down completely. In terms of the actual document that we produced as part of this independent review, now, during this process, the Scottish Parliament, understandably for making sure that the two governments were able to work in private space, the Parliament and its committees were obviously a bit behind in terms of the information we've been able to receive. Do you think you'd be able to give us some level of assurance that when that independent report is published, it can also come to the parliaments at the same time and the parliamentary committees at the same time as the two governments get it to allow parliament in these circumstances to have an appropriate overview? I, I can't give a commitment on behalf of the United Kingdom government, but I can give a commitment on behalf of the Scottish government that that would be our wish that that was the case. Okay. Okay. 
Malcolm Chisholm. I mean, I think people are concentrating on the, the review because for the next five years in practice, it's done and dusted in terms of the principle of it. But I think, I think the one question that, that remains for me is um, the baseline adjustment. So I, I take it that that will be based for 2017-18 on, on the forecast of the OBR for, is that right, for tax revenues in Scotland for that year? For? 2017-18. Well, well the, 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 the baseline position will be a year zero calculation, which will be based on 2016-17. It will be the, 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 the will be the reference yeah, point right, okay. so for 2017-18. So it's their prediction for that year? So Correct. But, so there will be, but there will be there will be a reconciliation of tax revenues back to... Um, for the, one year, for yeah, one year only, yeah. right. Now, but when will... And then, but in terms of... But the other thing that's important for the blog grant adjustment is, is the base year. So will, will the base year become the real... I mean, at what point will we know the real tax outturn for 2016-17 or for 2018-19? For will it still be using the prediction or will we know the real tax revenues for that year at that point? By 2018-19, the tax information for 16-17 will be near to finalisation. It might not quite be there. It might be... Yeah, maybe 1920, but it'll be not far away from it, I wouldn't have thought. But at a certain point, it will be the real yeah. figure that's the yeah. baseline. Yeah. Right. So well, anyway, I think that's, that's clear. That, that, I think the rest of it is quite clear for that. If I could just ask one other question, someone will come on to capital borrowing in a moment, but revenue borrowing obviously is related to this sentence about um, a Scottish-specific economic shock is triggered when onshore Scottish GBT GDP, presumably that means GDP growth, is below 1% in absolute terms on a rolling four-quarter basis. So does absolute mean cash or real terms? It, it means in cash terms. Cash terms, right. And rolling four-year quarter basis, that could mean at least two different things. So what does it mean? It, it, mean, it means it could be um, quarter one to quarter four of any given year, or it could be quarter three, quarter four, quarter one, quarter two. Right, so it's successive quarters. So it's successive, it's successive okay. quarters. Okay. Thank you, that's fine. Uh, Stuart McMillan, I think you have some questions around capital borrowing. Um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. Um, first of all, it's what considerations led the two governments to consider that the £3 billion would be a sufficient borrowing cap? Essentially, it's a product of a negotiation. One of the issues that the, um, that the Smith Commission required of us was that whatever agreements and arrangements were put in place, they had to operate within the fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. And the uh, you know, that's a product of the fact that in constitutional terms, we remain Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom, so it's understandable that there should be a requirement that we operate within the UK's fiscal framework. Uh, one of the issues that uh, I, have to be, I have to be mindful of is that the UK government has obviously set up its own UK fiscal framework, which requires by 2019-20 there will be no borrowing. Obviously, we take a different philosophical question on, on, on that subject, and the um, the, uh, so therefore any borrowing facility that we would want to have as a government has to be undertaken in a compatible fashion with the wider fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. Therefore, um, I have to be mindful of the fact that um, the UK government was, you know, was going to have to reach an agreement which would essentially contradict their wider fiscal framework. Um, for that reason, I accepted that we could not have um, a prudential borrowing regime because I accepted the Treasury required to have some degree of limitation on our, um, on our borrowing uh, limits so that they understood the extent to which we planned to borrow. And uh, for that reason, um, we negotiated a cap of £3 billion as the aggregate total of the capital borrowing of the, um, that would be available to Scotland. That's helpful. That also clarifies the, the situation regarding the potential borrowing. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that struck me when I was uh, reading through the, uh, the, the framework and the agreement was in certain paragraphs, uh, paragraph 57 from the capital borrowing and paragraph 73 to 76 regarding the reserve. 
Um, it just it struck me just in terms of uh, uh, in terms of a couple of agreements um, of cross border agreements that have taken place, particularly the city deals. Now, at some point, um, at some point down the line, because of uh, previous agreements between the two governments, and then also this subsequent agreement, if there was to be a situation where uh, the UK government decided that it didn't want to put in uh, the, the, the level of, of, uh, of expenditure that uh, previously had agreed to do so, would the Scottish Government then be compelled to actually uh, fund that particular shortfall uh, because of this uh, fiscal agreement? Is that a question in relation to city deals? Yes. Well, if, if, if the UK Government was to depart from its commitments to contribute to city deals, I think that would be, um, well, I'd, I'd consider that to be a breach of contract. So, that the fiscal framework has. You know, so there should be no effect. Well, the, the point that Mr. McMillan raises about <laughs> paragraph 57 um, is um, um, is relevant in the sense that it, it, it makes reference to the fact that the capital borrowing limits are in addition to the Scottish government's capital block grant, which as the committee will be aware is around about three billion pounds. So that is that is an implicit part of our financial arrangement with the United Kingdom Government. If that was to change, that would be a very substantial departure from the existing financial arrangements of the United Kingdom. And I would have a very, you know, I'd be entirely hostile to that uh, approach. If the UK Government was to say to us in due course, well, actually, we've decided that we're not going to fund the city deals anymore, I think that would be a breach of contract and it would be politically unacceptable. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Bob Gibson. And a piece of uh, evidence suggested to us that uh, they welcome the agreement and that they hope that, uh, uh, that now that the devolution can be uh, according to the proposed timetable in terms of welfare. Now, the Joint Ex Exchequer Committee was set up uh, as a temporary basis in order to run uh, the uh, tax powers devolved under the Scotland Act 2012. Um, but it's fallen into disuse. So, are there agreed terms of reference for the operation of the JEC, and will these be revised to accommodate the fiscal framework agreement? And will you commit to publishing the terms of reference and the outcomes of any meetings of the JEC? Well, the the the, the, the JEC has certainly not fallen into. Um, uh, I'm not, I think it was disrepair or disrepute that uh, Mr. Gibson raised. Disuse. Uh, uh, disuse. 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 Yes. Um, my, my apologies. Um, it, the, the, the Joint Share Committee has had 10 meetings on the subject of the fiscal framework, so it might have been in abeyance, but uh, it's certainly been very busy and very active in the last nine months. So the Joint Exchequer Committee's remit will be published as an annex to the technical document that will support the agreement that has been published already. And um, I would expect the Joint Exchequer Committee to, what the agreement sets out is the Joint Exchequer Committee will um, take the financial decisions in relation to the, um, well, the financial implicate, or consider the financial issues in relation to the devolution of welfare powers, but the Joint Ministerial Committee on Welfare will oversee the transfer of the welfare responsibilities, which by their nature is, um, uh, will have to be a, a carefully managed process given the dependence of individuals on particular benefits. Uh, thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, <coughs> is this joint ministerial working group on welfare? Um, um, beyond the implementation phase, can we see a similar role continuing for it? The, the, the Joint Ministerial Group on Welfare um, will, will have to supervise the arrangements for the, um, the devolution of welfare powers. Uh, that will take, um, th there isn't a timetable specified in the agreement about when that will be undertaken. Governments will wish to do that as swiftly as possible. But clearly we have to be mindful of the operational issues that will be involved in ensuring that happens. Um, and happens in a fashion that doesn't in any way disrupt or interrupt the um, access to payments and benefits by individuals within Scotland. Um, Deputy First Minister, will there be an agreed terms of reference as they will be published and reported uh, um, I, to I'm, Parliament? I'm not sure if there's a published terms of reference, but uh, uh, l let me check that point. I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be 
there will be a terms of reference for that group, but whether it's published or not, I'm not certain, but I'll endeavour to put that in the public domain if it's not there yet. And just finally, uh, convener, um, can the Deputy First Minister confirm that it's your position that all the intergovernmental arrangements that are set out in the fiscal framework will be covered in the written agreement between the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government that is currently being developed in relation to this? I, I, I certainly what my objective is is to reach a satisfactory agreement with the with Parliament on the um, the, the agreement between the government and the parliament about inter intergovernmental activity. Um, I saw, I was looking at some papers on that just last night, and uh, I certainly hope that, that we can. So my objective is to get to an agreement which is acceptable to the committee in that respect. Thank you for that. Uh, Scott, I think you want to ask him some questions on the Fiscal Commission. Thank you. If you'd accept, uh, Deputy First Minister, that the Fiscal Commission, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, I should quickly say, is an essential part of Parliament's ability to properly scrutinise um, both the, the, the <coughs> framework but also government expenditure more generally. Uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has um, a specified role in legislation to um, undertake a range of, of functions. Um, they will be expanded um, and given more authority mm. as a consequence of the agreement that has been reached, uh, particularly in relation to the forecasting of tax, mm. um, of non-domestic rates, of um, GDP within Scotland. So th the Fiscal Commission will have that responsibility. Mr Scott's question um, went into sort of broader questions about scrutinising, um, I think the words were, um, public expenditure or uh, kind of wider public commitments, finances, uh, public finances, and that's um, that's an issue which um, I have been pressed on by the Finance Committee, um, but uh, I don't believe it's part of the role of the Fiscal Commission to undertake that activity. I believe that's undertaken by Parliament and by Audit Scotland. Well, that's kind of why I asked the question, because I, I, I just wondered if you didn't accept that the um, Parliament is in a stronger institution, the, um, the Finance Committee and other <coughs> parliamentary committees, if it has really effective independent analysis, in this case of, of the public finances. Uh, and that's proven by Audit Scotland. Audit Scotland is the, is the way in which the Public Audit Committee of this Parliament works really effectively. And it only happens because, public, because Audit Scotland is quite independent of all of us. Don't you think that would equally and strongly apply to the Fiscal Commission in relation to the public finances and indeed your own fiscal rules? Um, well, I, 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 I think we're perhaps talking at cross purposes here. What I don't want the Fiscal Commission doing is what Audit Scotland is already constituted to do. Audit Scotland has got a duty to look at the, um, the management of the public finances and it exercises those responsibilities. Um, I, I don't want to see that being confused with the role of the Fiscal Commission, which is essentially to give us now official independent forecasts of the taxes that will be raised in Scotland uh, by the, the what are called the smaller taxes and um, income tax um, and also non-domestic rates and GDP. I quite agree. I, I couldn't agree more. There's no benefit whatsoever to any of us in having um, two public bodies mixed up in their, in their position. But my understanding of the Finance Committee was that their recommendation was very different uh, to that role of Audit Scotland. They were after the long-term financial sustainability of the public finances, which is very different from the role of Audit Scotland. Work, uh, I see every, and I've been on it five years. It's not that. It's not what Audit Scotland well, well, do. Well, I think I think I think what we've been I think what we've got to be clear about is, and, and I've had this discussion with the Finance Committee before, and I, I dare say we'll have it again at stage three, sure. depending on what um, provision, stage three of the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill, depending on what comes forward. But I, I'm, um, I, I've asked the Finance Committee, or uh, well, some of its members. I don't think it's a, a unanimous view of the Finance Committee that um, what. What, it, what they have in mind in terms of the scrutiny of fiscal rules. Yeah, I'm very clear about the fiscal rules within which I operate. Mm, Number sorry. one mm. is that I have to live within my means. Mm. Um, uh, if, uh, I know people, some people criticise me for having an underspend. Uh, there would be a queue of people to demand my head if I had an overspend. Mm. So an underspend to me is a consequence of not having an overspend. Mm. It's a rather symmetric a equation. So there's fiscal rule number one, we have to live within our means. Fiscal rule number two is that if we are um, undertaking capital borrowing, under this agreement, we can't capital borrow for more than £450 million. Pounds if we, well, if we try to, um, we'll be in breach of our fiscal rule. So there's another fiscal rule that's quite easily um, tested and, and, and undertaken. 
Um, and there's a whole variety of different rules like that. I have an internal rule about the degree to which we will support um, long-term investment by revenue finance mechanisms, and that is clearly auditable um, and reported upon within the budget document on an annual basis. So I, I, I'm, mm. I, I think there's a, you know, that's what I've got in my mind about what the fiscal rules are. I, I've asked the Finance Committee members if they have any other rules in mind, and I'll obviously uh, consider what, that, uh, what, what shape that looks like. But that's all, that's mm. all tangible. Mm and transparent and able to be scrutinised by Parliament. I have to confess I remember other people criticising underspends in previous administrations, but there we are. There, there we <laughs> that's, are. What, that's, what, I, that's, I, what, that's what people are like, unfortunately, I, I, Mr I, Scott. I, I, wish, I, I, the, I like. wish I brought the official report from 2005, but there we are. Right. Um, uh, uh, one final question, if I may, Deputy First Minister. Um, presumably you'd accept that the Fiscal Commission will have, because of the remarks you made earlier about its role and responsibilities in relation to independent forecasting, does it have a greater call on public resources? Do, do, does it need to be augmented? as a public body in terms of um, specialist staff, statisticians and others, or is the plan, that maybe those things have yet to be resolved, but uh, is the plan to, to bo boost up that organisation? Th th those issues are, are yet to be resolved and finalised, but I accept the principle of Mr Scott's question. Um, there will have to be independent capacity within the Scottish Fiscal Commission um, to undertake what is going to be a, a very significant role, because essentially the Fiscal Commission will be responsible for a forecast of GDP which will um, have a, a, a significant effect on the testing of the, um, the triggers for resource borrowing in relation to Scottish-only economic shock that Mr Chisholm yes. questioned me about earlier, and also the forecasting of taxes upon which public expenditure will be dependent. Mm. Now, what I have in my mind um, for this is that the um, one of the criticisms, the Fiscal Commission have been quite resistant to undertaking the role of being the official forecasters. They have raised the fair question, which mm. is, well, if we have made the forecast, who challenges our forecast? Mm. Mm. And what is in my mind, and what I'm discussing with the Fiscal Commission, is that there will be a professional staff within the Commission, a Commission staff um, appointed by the Commission, who will do the detailed work to formulate the forecast and that will essentially then be challenged by the members of the Commission who are uh, appointed yeah. by Parliament and who will be there to scrutinise the professional forecast yeah. that comes from um, individuals appointed for that purpose mm -hmm. and appointed for that by, um, uh, by the Fiscal Commission's agreement. So, um, now, I told the Finance Committee yesterday that I thought it was unlikely that those arrangements could be in place credibly and dependably for the 2017-18 budget, because that process will have to essentially be concluded by September the 20th. And I think that's a tall order to ask the Fiscal Commission to get to be equipped to handle that in such a short time scale. But I will, um, um, so there will have to be some form of interim arrangement put in place for which I'm sure Parliament will understand for 1718, but I would want us to be in a position where that independent capacity was available as soon as possible thereafter to, to undertake those tasks. I suppose I might just observe that Brian Ashcroft won't go away. He'll still be independently forecasting. Well, 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 yes, of course, and, and that will be, and, 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 and as, as, it should, as it should be, yeah. because that will, give, that will give some wider context mm, to, mm. The, um, to, to the forecast of GDP that is produced by the Fiscal yeah, Commission. Absolutely. Thank you. And I should also, perhaps I should also add, the, the, the agreement envisages significant interaction between the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR, which is really very important given the fact that we have had quite significant deviations in forecasts about taxation mm -hmm. that we believed could be raised in Scotland, which the OBR thought could be higher. And in fact, what I think we'll see in, 15, in, in the current financial year is that the forecasts of the Scottish Government have been much closer to um, what would be envisaged. Belinda, um, Malcolm Chisholm wanted to ask a question about comparability. Yeah, factors. I, just, I just wondered how, you know, how the comparability factors were decided upon. Was, was there much dispute about that, or was that fairly straightforward? Uh, they, they are essentially um, they are a product of the com of the um, comparison of tax contributions that were arrived at by uh, that, that, are, that are generated by Scotland, and that essentially. Um, drives those factors. And that was quite easy for VAT as well as the other ones, was it? Um, well, the, 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 
issues around um, a VAT are slightly um, uncertain, given the fact that we've yet to agree the methodology that will underpin all of that analysis. But you know, I felt it was a reasonable basis upon which we could uh, conclude these issues. Okay, Linda Fabiani. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to more or less go back to where we started this conversation. Um, it, it was very clear during the Smith Commission that uh, everyone involved felt that in any kind of negotiation, both governments should be treated as, as equal partners. And I, I'd just like your view on how that applies in the run-up uh, to the negotiations that will come after the agreed period, during them and beyond that and with generally with the dealings of anything round about this entire process? Well, I, I, I think the, the Smith Commission was, was very clear that there had to be um, a, 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 a process entered into that would see a fiscal commission, a, a fiscal agreement um, arrived at by both governments on a mutual basis, an equal mm -hmm. basis. And that's exactly what's happened here. And um, one of the issues that the First Minister and I were determined to ensure was the case that when it came to review in 2022, that the same dynamics existed for the Scottish Parliament so, uh, and the Scottish Government. So the, the, we will have that ability to secure agreement on an equal basis in 2022, just as we have been able to exercise that in line with the Smith Commission's recommendations um, in formulating this uh, fiscal framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of issues um, within the framework that I would feel that would also apply to and I would like some reassurance. One of them is the dispute resolution process uh, and I notice that as part of that um, there is an element where it is a senior staff as opposed to ministers um, who would try and sort out the dispute. Um, so does that parity of esteem extend directly from ministers to senior staff who are acting on their behalf? The, the aim of the dispute resolution um, mechanisms is to, uh, is, is to essentially try to get to agreement as quickly as possible. In my mm -hmm. experience on intergovernmental disputes, uh, the longer they go on, the more difficult they are to resolve and the more protracted they become. So therefore, um, and if they can be resolved at official level, if there can be some um, agreement put in place that uh, addresses that, then that would be, that would be, my view, very advantageous as a, as a consequence. So we, um, I think the, the focus on ensuring that um, early intervention is delivered to try to resolve disputes um, and to resolve them on, a, on an agreed basis um, is implicit in the dispute resolution mechanism. Right, so that would be, you know, with a parity of esteem. Well, essentially, well, obviously, if, you know, if, I, if, I, if one of my officials was trying to resolve a dispute with the UK government counterpart, um, they're only going to be able to come to, they're only going to be able to close that dispute down if they can come to me and say, we've managed to get something that we think mm. is a, a reasonable level of agreement. If they can't, then it'll just go, it'll just go up the ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, until it gets to ministers. And if it gets mm -hmm. to ministers, you know, well, sometimes it's easier to resolve, sometimes it's more difficult to resolve. <laughs> but you know, the moral of the story for me is that the earlier we can resolve these questions, the better. The other thing I was interested in was um, no detriment to, it's been referred to, it's in relation to policy spillover effects. Um, and I just wondered if you could give us a rough outline of how you would see that kind of discussion taking place. Well, essentially, the, the, the whole question of um, policy spillovers is, um, is aimed to be addressed as um, on an evidence base. So we, 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 we've, we've tabulated within the agreement um, the categories of policy spillovers between direct effects and behavioural effects. And um, we, have, um, uh, we have specifically ruled out um, second round or indirect effects from the process, which I think is really very helpful. Um, direct effects, um, I think, will be much more tangible to determine and um, there will be sufficient data uh, to inform 
an assessment of behavioural effects. And of course, as part of this process, we can draw on information from the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission to try to help us to resolve any outstanding questions in this respect. Thank you. Welcome, I'm just looking at some of the written evidence. Uh, Professor Muscatelli says the main issue will be whether the two governments will always agree what a direct effect is and what a behavioural effect is or uh, what material represents in the context of behavioural effects. So do you think potentially there are some uh, issues there that might become quite contentious? There, 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 there could be because there will be. Um, I think the fact that we've ruled out second round effects or indirect effects helps this area quite significantly because it clears away um, a, a, a lot of territory that could be the subject of speculation um, around areas that, that may result in policy spillovers. You know, there are some direct effects that will be really quite tangible if the Scottish Government expands um, access to a particular benefit, which is a passport benefit within the United Kingdom, and it leads to a, a disproportionate upsurge in DWP claims, then I think that will be pretty demonstrable. Yeah. And that's why I, I, I cite evidence as part of that process. Um, so there will, be, um, there will be examples where um, I think it is possible to put together evidence that will substantiate a position. And both governments have entered into this in good faith. And we should be aware of the potential implications of any of our decisions as we take them and how they may affect uh, other parts of the United Kingdom. On that area, in paragraph 50 of the agreement on behavioural effects in particular, it talks about behavioural effects that impact tax revenue can be taken into account where in exceptional circumstances they're de de demonstrated to be material. Who decides what the exceptional circumstances are? That would be decided by agreement between the two governments. Essentially, you know, the reading of paragraph 50 could only be read in a fashion to say that's a very high bar. Uh, that, that would, you know, material and demonstrable, exceptional. This is not an everyday occurrence. This is a very, very rare occasion in which that would happen. So there would have to be an acceptance of um, the... The, the, the exceptional nature of circumstances that would give rise to such a claim and that would have to be agreed between both governments. And if, if, if there wasn't an agreement about whether an exceptional circumstance or material change was in, in play? Uh, in, in Clause 52, um, any decision or transfer relating to spillover effect must be jointly agreed by both governments. Without a joint agreement, no transfer or decision will be made. Well, that's quite clear. Who would def is, there, is there any development or any work being carried out in and around how we could reduce res disputes in and around that high bar, how that would be described, that dispute resolution? Is that, is that something that has been developed and, uh, you know, there is a terms of understanding there about when a situation would be escalated or, or not, whether it would be resolved at an earlier stage or not? Or is there, what, what development has been carried out there between the two governments? In, in relation to the resolution of these questions, um, you know, my answer to Linda Fabiani was designed to illustrate through the dispute resolution mechanism how we you know, the dispute resolution mechanism doesn't automatically involve the issues being escalated to the Prime Minister and the First Minister as the first port of call. Uh -huh. there's, a, there's a gradation of involvement, the presumption being we should try to resolve these issues at official level as quickly as we possibly can do to avoid them becoming issues of greater uh -huh. significance. Um, so that's the, the presumption in the agreement is to try to resolve these matters early. The second issue is about the wording of paragraph 50. And paragraph 50 has been worded to essentially create that very high bar. Uh -huh. So it would not be a rudimentary issue yeah. that would be dealt with. I, 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 and I, I think, understand so, and, that. And, and I think that's in, in, in part, of, part of why I've from a, explained from a previous, it. From a previous life, understand the, the, the principle agreement of a heads agreement. That's why I'm concentrating you know, a bit on the detail. Because at, at what I'm asking is, is there a, a process that's been developed that ensures that 
if you have a dispute that's got to be clearly defined, it's got to be within a, a, a scale. Uh, if you fail to agree early on in that process, what takes you to the next? I'm, I'm, I'm just There's wondering no, if that detail has been left out or, 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 or indeed if, if it's necessary between... Well, that's, I think that, 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 that last point is, is, is the key point. The, 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 there, will be no, um, there will be no further definition of what material means. Right, so, so you can declare so, that yourself as so you wish. We have to agree what is material and that... And I think that's the right. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with that approach because I would, um, I think we'd find it very difficult to agree long-term parameters of what we decide to be material or demonstrable or exceptional. Um, I think we'll know it when we see it, and we'll have to make a judgment about what we believe we need to argue for, given the development of certain circumstances. Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener. Um, on the issue of welfare, Professor Spicker, in his submission, um, points out that the framework document states that the governments have agreed that any new benefits or discretionary payments introduced by the Scottish Government must provide additional income for a recipient and not result in automatic offsetting by the UK Government in their entitlement anywhere else in the UK benefits system and well, he, he certainly believes, as do others, that it's not quite sure yet how that effect is to be achieved and the situation is a bit unclear. I just wonder if the Deputy First Minister could provide some clarity around this question. Uh, I, 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 think the, I think the section gives all of the necessary clarity. It essentially makes the point which was um, crucial in the Smith Commission deliberations that if the Scottish Government was enhancing or creating an, enhancing the existing benefit or creating a new benefit, that the, the, the impact of that on an individual could not be clawed back by any other intervention of the UK system and its interaction. And that puts the onus <laughs> on the United Kingdom Government to ensure that they don't act in a fashion that, 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 that a, in potentially contradicts the impact of a benefit change that the Scottish Government might decide to do. Okay, I mean, Professor Spicker is obviously concerned about how this will work in practice. I mean, he believes that as things stand, that if the Scottish Government were to introduce a, a top-up to the state pension, it might reduce entitlement to pension credit and housing benefit. So is work ongoing at the moment to ensure that these systems will be in place when they need to be? The, 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 but clearly that the clause in the fiscal framework, which has simply taken forward the conclusions of the Smith Commission at clause 55 in the Smith Commission report, um, would have to be um, taken into account by the UK Government in any exercise of its reserved responsibilities to ensure that the value of that change delivered by the Scottish Government was protected for an individual involved. Now, we're not at that point yet, but if we got to that point, that is what would be required through, by virtue of this agreement. Okay. Um, the Child Poverty Action Group, in their um, submission today on topping up reserved benefits, are, uh, they're asking, is it feasible that if the Scottish Government decided to top up a reserved benefit, such as child benefit or child tax credit, it might ask that this top-up be administered by the UK government in return for a reasonable and proportionate administrative charge. Is that something that has been the, the, looked at? The, 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 there is um, certainly, uh, I'm sure that would be a possibility uh, to be considered, uh, but no decisions or consideration has been given, uh, no decisions have been made and no consideration has been given to that question. Okay. Thank you. I've got one other area, Deputy First Minister, I'd like to just have a quick chat about the, the Sewell Convention issue, because in paragraph 32 of the Supplementary Legislative Consent Motion, the suggestion there from the Scottish Government that the Sewell Convention could be more fully implemented than has already happened, but there's no real explanation about, beyond that about what's meant by it. I'd just like to understand about why that was well, there in the essentially, the, um, 
the, the, what we had hoped for was the Scotland Bill would um, contain on the face of the Bill um, a stronger and more comprehensive explanation of what is actually involved in the Seoul Convention, what, what happens, what is required, what the obligation is, um, to simply preserve the arrangement or to put into statute the arrangements that have been existing have existed um, as a convention since um, the commitment was given by Lord Sewell in the House of Lords in 1997. Now, what the what the bill does is essentially, essentially restate the words used by Lord Sewell at that time, but we would have preferred there to be a, a greater description of what is involved in the process so that the interests of the Scottish Parliament were more emphatically protected by statute on an ongoing basis. The UK Government has chosen not to do so. I assume that would also provide more clarity in what issues were in play under an LCM process and which weren't. The, 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 essentially, the, um, the, that approach would give a more visible statutory anchoring to the process and therefore um, because it was a factor in statute, uh, I think create greater obligation to be more mindful of the, uh, the, uh, the implications of the Seoul Convention. Any hint from the UK Government at this stage that might be prepared to? Yeah, I, the, my my judgment is the UK Government is, um, is, is essentially uh, believes the Scotland Bill issues are now complete. I think that would be a fair sum. UK Ministry, I th I think, have you seen the Secretary of State? Is it, so it's come in came in late last night as a supply from the Secretary. Yeah, but I, 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 I would be surprised yeah. if the UK government is, you know, in, in, on the wider question about the legislative consent memorandum, uh, the legislative consent memorandum is, is worded in a fashion to, to say to the committee that we, uh, and to Parliament, uh, the Scottish government has not got all that it wanted out of the, um, the, the Scotland Bill. We think there's a number of other provisions where it, the Scotland Bill could have been strengthened um, and the sole convention, the sole provisions is, is one of those areas. Uh, but stepping back from it, looking at the Scotland Bill and the fiscal framework in the round, the government has taken the view that as it's currently proposed, uh, the Scotland Bill is worthy of legislative consent by Parliament. And of course there has been quite a significant enhancement of the Scotland Bill since it started its parliamentary journey in the House of Commons uh, some time ago. And we welcome the changes that have been made to the bill by the United Kingdom government. It has made it easier for the Scottish government to recommend the bill for legislative consent. Okay, thank you. Um, one last request of you. There's been a number of areas where we, there's obviously ongoing discussion between the Treasury and the, and the, uh, the UK government and the Scottish government across a range of areas. I, I, I mentioned some of them earlier in, in the a contribution I made myself. I think it would be useful, Deputy First Minister, if you could write to us telling us what you think these, what that menu of remaining areas is that you know this committee needs to either, if it's reconstituted after the election, or recommend to a successor committee what areas they need to be aware of uh, on an ongoing process over the coming years. So. I think, I think on, on that question, I'm happy to do that, Kevin. I'll, I'll give that matter some thought. But the, the Parliament itself needs to consider how the, uh, the implementation of the Scotland Bill is overseen, and that's obviously an issue for the, the next parliamentary term uh, to consider, uh, because there will be very significant issues around the implementation of all of these provisions that will require um, extensive parliamentary scrutiny, and uh, obviously that, that, that issue will be with Parliament to resolve. Okay. Thank you very much for coming along and giving us evidence today. We're most grateful. Um, I now suspend this meeting until 10.25. Thank you very much.
Okay, colleagues, we welcome to our second panel of witnesses this morning. We have with us today the Right Honourable David Medell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, the Right Honourable Greg Hans, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and the official supporting them is Francia Francesca Wasowska, um, from the who is the Director of this, the Scotland Office. I hope I got that right, Francesca. Um, We've obviously got quite a number of questions we want to get through, so I ask my colleagues to keep the questions as tight as we can and say the same to our, to our um, witnesses this morning. But Secretary of State, Chief Secretary, does anyone want to make an opening statement to begin this process? Uh, Mr Crawford, thank you very much for accommodating us uh, this morning and thank you particularly for accommodating me uh, by video link uh, last week. I'm pleased to be here in person and not down on the floor as I, uh, as I was a... Uh, uh, as I was last uh, week. Mr Hans has given a, uh, an opening statement of over an hour before uh, your colleagues uh, in the Finance Committee, including uh, Mr Macdonald, who is, uh, 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 who is doubling up uh, this morning. I just wanted to give you a very short update on where uh, the bill is in, uh, within the parliamentary uh, process. On Monday, the bill completed its report stage uh, in the House of Lords. At that stage, we were able to make uh, the amendments in relation to the borrowing powers that came forth from uh, the fiscal framework. We now obviously await this Parliament's consideration of the legislative consent motion, of which obviously your committee and its report will play a very important part in the Parliament coming to its deliberation. However, I do want to put on record that I very much welcome the fact that the Scottish Government, uh, in, their, uh, in their proposal, uh, recommend uh, that an LCM is uh, agreed. Subject to Parliament agreeing the LCM, then the bill uh, will proceed to third reading in the House of Lords. At that stage, there would only be proposals for some technical amendments agreed uh, with the Scottish Government and also a proposal to include uh, powers in relation to irresponsible parking, which is a matter that the Parliament is taking forward. The bill would then need to come back to the House of Commons for confirmation of uh, these amendments that have been made uh, in the Lords. I don't anticipate that if that was the case that there would be uh, any significant challenge to those amendments and then the bill would proceed to royal assent. I've set out in my letter to you of yesterday uh, a timetable in relation to implementation of uh, specific parts of the bill, which was one of the issues that we discussed uh, in our previous evidence session. Thank you, Secretary of State. Can, can I begin by a question to the Chief Secretary? Um, you might, you'll be aware that the Deputy First Minister uh, here has said quite clearly that he wants to publish all of the key documents as far as the discussions that preceded the, the fiscal framework agreement uh, prior to dissolution of the Scottish Parliament uh, in order to aid scrutiny by this, part, by this committee and by the wider Parliament. Do you support the publication of these documents? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, um, Mr Chairman, let me um, thank you first of all for inviting me this morning and uh, I won't make a statement uh, because uh, the Secretary of State's already made one, but thank you for the uh, opportunity to come along and answer questions about uh, um, the fiscal framework. Uh, in terms of the documentation, I think the first thing to state is there already is a lot of documentation out there. I mean, there's obviously the, uh, the framework itself, uh, the technical annex which will follow, uh, and also from the 10 meetings of the Joint Exchequer Committee, uh, there are the communiques uh, from those as well. Uh, so there's been a reasonable amount of documentation there to be able to see of the sort of the progress and see the issues uh, that have been uh, debated. However, the two governments agreed uh, not, first of all, not to have a constant running commentary on the negotiations. And the second area that I'd say, I think it um, is to be consistent with previous negotiations. Uh, I think it is very important for the two governments to be able to negotiate in a space uh, where they have confidence um, that the papers or matters under discussion will not uh, be released in that way. Uh, and I think given the fact this is not the first and it certainly won't be the last uh, negotiation between the two governments, uh, I think it is important that the papers uh, remain uh, uh, confidential. I think there's been a lot of commentary out there. I think I'm very happy to talk about things like um, the different models that have been proposed and so on. But I think the actual papers, I think, uh, it, I think it would in the long run be unhelpful to release those. 
the, the committee, all the way through the process, have understood the need for space to be made available for the two governments to be able to discuss these matters. We understood that there shouldn't be a run commentary. I think we were pretty patient on it, actually, as far as that process was concerned. But there is now an agreement uh, in, in place, and certainly in terms of the key documentation of that, you've laid out some of the, the broad areas of documentation, but there's obviously a lot of the process that, that allowed that the, the, the final outcome to be arrived at is something that this committee has never had the opportunity to, to see that detail. So would you object to, to that level of detail being published? Because I think well, we would certainly like to see it published. I think, uh, Mr Crawford, I think it would be very unhelpful um, for the integrity of intergovernmental uh, negotiations in this area. Um, and don't forget also the UK government does negotiations with other devolved administrations. But I think probably the more important thing is that uh, I think the most important thing now is to, uh, is to start talking about uh, how the powers will be deployed uh, rather than how we got to the agreement. I mean, the agreement is in place. Uh, both governments are happy with the agreement. Uh, both governments have said this is a major uh, step forward. Uh, both governments feel that the agreement uh, can be defended, justified to their parliaments, uh, is fair on taxpayers in Scotland, fair on taxpayers in the rest of the UK. Uh, and now I think is the time to move forward uh, in terms of how we all debate how these powers should be used. Yeah, but this isn't just about an agreement between two governments. This is about the Scottish Parliament being able to clearly understand what's been agreed. We have, as, a, as our responsibility, is to publish, is to give our recommendation to whether or not there should be a legislative consent motion passed in the Scottish Parliament. We still to decide that as a committee. We will decide that in the course of the, in the next week or two. So in these circumstances, it would aid us significantly to be able to see these key documents before we come to a situation where we've got to sign off our report from this committee. So I ask you again, in that light, would, would you object to these key documents being published? Well, I, I, I'll stick to my position, Mr Crawford, but I think if you're asking whether you need more information to understand what has been agreed, um, then I, I, would be, uh, I, I, I would think that, that is um, uh, essential to be able to, to understand what has been agreed. But I don't think one needs to... I think it's all there in the agreement. It's all there in the fiscal framework. I mean, I don't think one needs to see um, the papers... Uh, that have been flying around between the two governments to understand what has been agreed and what is in front of us in terms of the fiscal framework. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, what has been agreed is in the agreement. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Chief Secretary, I think the slight problem I have with that line of argument is there's been an agreement, but we're back here in five years' time. So the point that the convener is rightly making about pub publishing information that would allow this committee to scrutinise what's been agreed is something we'll need for five years' time hence anyway, because the one thing the Deputy First Minister said this morning is that you're committed, and you might want to confirm this from the UK government's point of view, you're committed to providing detailed evidence on an annual basis as to how this fiscal framework is going to work, because we're all going to be right around the same room in the same table discussing again in five years' time. So doesn't that support the point the convener is making about publishing the data and the full information now? Okay, I, I, let me try and deal with the, the two parts of that. I think in terms of the information on the workings of the fiscal framework, yes, uh, Smith states that there will be an annual report uh, uh, done on the working of the fiscal framework. That is correct. In terms of the review in five years' time, uh, I think we're forgetting two important things here. Uh, first is that it will be an independent review, and that is written into the agreement. Uh, there will be an independent report into the workings of block grant adjustment, uh, followed by a review of the whole uh, fiscal framework. And I think the other thing is that by that point, it will be informed by five years of experience of the fiscal framework. So whereas today we can debate hypotheticals and different models and how different models uh, might perform in the future and perhaps did perform or would have performed in the past, uh, by that point we're actually dealing, dealing with real life experience over five years. And that's why I've got a lot of confidence in the ability of that independent review uh, to come up with a, a, a solution uh, that uh, will suit uh, both governments and ultimately both governments will have to agree uh, um, in terms of the precise model that is taken forward from that time. 
I understand that. Also, I think we're interested in what suits parliaments, not so much governments, because that's what we're here to do, to scrutinise what you're actually doing. And, and Convener's asking you to give us information which should help us to do that, and I hear what you say on that. Um, can you just clarify, since you mentioned the models, um, my understanding of reading Clause 23 of the, of the agreement is that it, uh, and it says it will be open to either government to propose changes to the fiscal framework, and then it goes on to make some other points. Um, the Deputy First Minister said an hour ago that we now have a Treasury-run model which delivers no financial detriment. Uh, is, that, would that, is that fair? Is, is, the, is the model that is now in place, uh, the Treasury-run model, but what it does in effect is, to, as we know clearly, because that's what the agreement says, there is no financial detriment to the, to the Scottish Government or to the Scottish Parliament? Uh, well, let me try and answer um, <clears throat> the different parts of that question. I mean, I, I, Going back to the original point about uh, um, documentation, I mean, I, I think if the committee has got questions about how the fiscal framework will work, um, then I think those, those, those questions could be addressed um, to uh, both governments uh, without the need to have access um, to those papers. Okay. You know, I think that is a genuine thing. I'm sure uh, I can't really speak on behalf of the Deputy First Minister, but I think if people have questions to me, as to what the Treasury view is, how the fiscal framework works, um, then I would be happy uh, to answer those. Uh, in terms of going forward, I mean, I think the most important thing is that at all points we have proposed things which have been consistent uh, with Smith. Uh, and that, I think, has been incredibly important in this whole process um, to be uh, correct and aligned uh, with uh, uh, Smith. In terms of how our model works or how the agreed model works, the comparability model, um, it works in a very similar way to Barnet. Um, you take the change in the uh, comparable UK tax, uh, you multiply it by a population share for Scotland, and then you multiply it by a comparability factor, uh, very similar to how Barnet works. And that comparability factor uh, takes uh, what today is uh, paid uh, by the average person in Scotland and those particular taxes. So for income tax, that percentage is 89% uh, because the average Scot pays 89% of, of, of what the average uh, UK taxpayer pays in income tax. Uh, and that rises up to, uh, I think, the aggregates levy, for example, is 189%. So all of the different comparability factors, uh, rather like Barnet on spending, uh, reflect the amount of tax uh, paid by Scots in those areas. Okay, can I ask one final question, um, Convener? You said earlier on, Chief Secretary, that um, you didn't want to publish the information because you also negotiate with other areas of the UK, but wouldn't it be fair to say that our Welsh colleagues and our Northern Irish colleagues, never mind Metropolitan Manchester and the other things that you're doing within England, be very keen to see this kind of information because you are effectively rolling negotiations on lots of aspects of finance and all these formulas are very important for all the parts of the nations of the United Kingdom, never mind just the Treasury and the Scottish Parliament. Well, uh, again, I think the most important thing is the integrity of intergovernmental negotiations uh, is the most important thing to preserve. And I think that's uh, in the best interests of uh, both governments in trying to reach a deal. Uh, I'm not going to let you in any, any secret. It's not been always straightforward uh, to get to this uh, fiscal framework agreement. We've had 10 meetings uh, over a period of, I think, about nine months. Uh, and I wouldn't want to do anything that would make it any more difficult to get to that sort of an agreement. Thank you. Hmm. I, just, I need to tease this out just a bit more because there will be papers which have been jointly put together by both the Treasury and the Scottish Government. That's inevitable as part of a process that's been going on. And if I got the sense of what the Deputy First Minister was telling us right, uh, uh, earlier, he would be content for these sort of papers to be published. Now, he didn't say that, but that's the intent, I'm sure, behind what he said. Um, in these circumstances, that sort of joint, these joint papers, and if the Scottish Government wanted to publish, would you object to these papers being published? Well, I think you're asking me, uh, um, uh, Ms. Crawford, like a hypothetical situation uh, where I think it would be difficult for me uh, um, to comment. I think I've given my view clearly on what I think the merits or demerits of publishing the papers in the negotiations have been, and I'll stick to that. Well, I just... I'm, I'm, that concerns me because it's not just about this committee. There are also people who have given evidence to us from across Scotland over the, over the period of the, the last months, experts who have come and given us guidance on what to do. And we effectively will be denying not just this committee, but the, the people who have been d discussing issues with this committee and the experts who have been involved with access to the information to enable them to decide whether this deal was the appropriate deal for Scotland and in the longer term 
um, what their, 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 their appropriate arrangements might be. So we start off from a, a very difficult position. Duncan, do you want to come in? I, I mean, I apologise, Chief Secretary, for returning to this question, because this is a complete departure from the narrative that we have had from the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Deputy First Minister of Scotland. We as a committee have been very patient, as the convener said, in respect to not wishing to have not wishing to have a running commentary about the negotiation. But the heads of agreement have been signed. We fully expected until today that we would have sight of those key documents as promised. We are entering a new era in moving on from devolution into shared powers. And I'm sure the Secretary of State and the briefing papers that you had have, have indicated how important that we believe that the shared information is essential to the success and sustainability of these new shared powers. Today, it is clear, Chief, uh, uh, Chief Secretary, that you are putting an embargo on the information that this Parliament and its committees can have, and it's not acceptable. I hope, I don't expect you to you say, oh, I've changed my mind here right now. I don't expect that. But I, I expect you to go back and seriously reflect about what this Parliament needs and this committee needs in terms of evaluating the workings of government uh, and, and the context that we find ourselves in at this point to recommend, uh, uh, make an appropriate recommendation to this Parliament. Currently, the information that we have are not, is not acceptable. Uh, we, we need to get what we expected, and if we don't get what we expected, then it's not acceptable in any manner or means. Well, uh, um, thank you. If I could just try and answer um, uh, and that really in, in, in three ways. Uh, first of all, in terms of whatever promises have been made uh, to this committee uh, have not been uh, uh, promises uh, made by me, and I've been asked by the Scottish Affairs Committee in the House of Commons uh, uh, also, and I've not, that's not a promise that I have made. Um, secondly, I'm not aware that, that documentation, this kind of negotiation, has been published before. If you were to tell me that uh, documentation, joint papers, before. Scottish rate of income tax negotiations have been published, uh, then, then I'm all ears. Um, the third thing, and I think most importantly, is moving on from here. I have stated uh, my willingness on behalf of the, of the UK government to give you whatever information is needed to uh, understand the workings of the fiscal framework, the agreement that has been signed and agreed. And that is surely the most important thing, is understanding uh, how the fiscal framework will actually operate in practice. Um, because, again, the most important thing that we can move on to now is having the debate about the use of the powers uh, and how those powers would work. So I'm very happy to answer any questions on how the fiscal framework, as agreed between the, governments, the two governments, will work. Okay. We're, not going We're not going to make any progress in that. Stuart? You know, I, mean, I, think, I have to say, I think it's disappointing that that's the position the Treasury is taking on the publication of material that this Parliament expects and this committee would find, and I'm sure other committees would find very useful, but let's, let's move on from that. Um, the position is now that we, we, we know, given the publication of the agreement between the two governments, what will be in place for the next five years. But could you, uh, Chief Secretary, take us through uh, what the Treasury's understanding is of the review process and what would happen if an agreement is reached by the uh, end of the financial year 21-22, uh, uh, and possibly more importantly, what would happen if no agreement is reached um, on what is to follow the, after the five-year period um, uh, by the end of the financial year 21-22? Okay, thank you. Um, well, let me <clears throat> talk a little bit about that. Um, the review process, uh, there's really two parts to the review process. Um, first of all, during the course of, and this is all in the agreement uh, and signed up to, obviously, uh, by both governments, who are happy with this process. Uh, during 2021, to report by the end of 2021, there will be a report on the block grant adjustment mechanism, uh, which will be an independent report uh, done by uh, a person or persons or bodies, uh, which will be agreed by uh, the two governments. And I've got a lot of confidence in that process and finding the right uh, uh, people or bodies to do that independent report. There'll then be early in 2022 
a review of the whole of the fiscal framework uh, um, uh, commissioned uh, by the uh, two governments, or worked on, I should say, between um, the two governments, uh, which will inform that whole process. But going beyond there, I mean, there is no, uh, there is no default option. Uh, there is no uh, prejudice in favour of one model or another, or whatever other new models uh, may come along. And it's no secret that uh, a variety of models uh, have been looked at in the process um, over the last uh, nine to ten months. Um, and, but there is genuinely no prejudice uh, for or against any particular model um, this far out in advance. But probably the most important thing, though, is that that process will be informed by real experience over those five years in a way that is impossible to have today. It's impossible for us to... Uh, I've seen different numbers uh, uh, flying around. I've seen different graphs produced by different academics and different outside bodies. Uh, when we get to 2021, 2022, there will be real experience out there, uh, which I think is, uh, uh, will make the uh, process uh, very, very much easier. Thank you, and I, I'm, uh, that's, that's very clear, and um, I don't think anybody was suggesting any different. But uh, given that there'll be um, five years of experience, which you've, you've um, uh, made great play of just there, uh, in place, and as I said, we, we reach the, um, uh, the independent review, a report, sorry, and then we have the review, uh, and then an agreement, hopefully, between the two governments. If that agreement is not reached at that point, I presume that the model that's in place for those five years will carry on. Well, there's a, as I said, uh, um, uh, Ms Crawford, there's no prejudice in favour or against any particular model. But most importantly, I'm really confident that the two governments will come to an agreement. Uh, we've done it time and again. Uh, we did it over the Scottish rate of income tax. We've just done it over the fiscal framework. Uh, informed by an independent review, informed by five years of experience, uh, I am really confident and upbeat that the two governments... Uh, will be able to uh, uh, have the will to, to make that agreement uh, when that time comes. Yeah, yeah and, and I'm sure we all w w would hope that's the case and we would expect that to be the case, but I'm not sure why you're having a difficulty here. Um, the Deputy First Minister was very clear this morning that um, effectively, in his view, the Scottish Government's view, um, the, the, the no detriment model that was in pl is in place for the next five years would carry on until such times as an agreement was made. When I asked um, the Secretary of State of Scotland last week is it your understanding that the no detriment arrangement will carry on after that period? On after that period, you said, I confirm that no mechanism would be imposed at the end of that period without agreement. Therefore, if there's no agreement, it must surely be the case, I mean, I don't know why you're having a difficulty here, that the model that's currently in place, the no detriment model, which is agreed for the next five years, will carry on until such times as there's an agreement between the two, two governments. Isn't that the case? Well, uh, let me try and answer both parts of that, because the model that has been agreed um, for the next five years is the comparability model, uh, but for the transitional period, should Scotland's population grow differently to that in the rest of the UK, it will be reconciled to what PCID would have delivered. Yeah? So that is what, if you like, the status quo is. But secondly, going into that independent review, there is no uh, prejudice, there's no default option in favour of the continuation of any particular model. Uh, going into that. And, I, I, and again, I, I just have confidence that the governments will be able to deal with this uh, when we get there, informed by a lot of experience and informed by an independent review. That's entirely the right and proper way for this to proceed. So, sorry, sorry, Chief Secretary, but, you know, um, I haven't suggested, I don't think anyone suggested that there's a, a particular model post the agreement that's, you know, the, the position would be. That's to be agreed. What... You know, what I'm trying to understand is why you're having a difficulty, and I, what under, I was trying to ask, which I thought was a straightforward question. If there's no agreement, there can't be nothing happens after uh, the end of March 2022. There can't be no, I mean, there must be something in place. There must be a fiscal framework that underpins all of the transfer of powers, the income tax and all the other stuff with welfare that has been agreed in the Scotland Bill. Therefore, something must be in place. If it's not the, the, to carry on the model that's already been agreed, the comparability model with the no detriment effect, which equals the per capita index, indexation reduction model, then what is it that will replace it? I mean, well, well, again, uh, um, uh, uh, again, there'll be as an unprejudiced uh, position, there'll be no default indexation model. Both governments are clear on that, and that is part of the agreement, uh, that uh, we will put that to the independent review uh, an independent report and the review process at the time when we get there. And I remain confident uh, 
uh, I, I've got, I've got you know, a lot of confidence in uh, uh, John Swinney or uh, uh, the UK government's ability to come to these agreements. Uh, and that is what I think is the most important thing. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry, Kavira, but I, I'm not questioning your confidence. I'm not questioning the confidence of John Swinney or whoever's in these posts at that time. But, you know, it really must be surely extremely easy for you to say that if there's no agreement in place by, the, by, the, by my end of March 2022, then the, 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 the model that's being used at that point will carry on until such time as both governments agree. That might surely must be the case. You can't have nothing in place at that point. So if it's not the model that is already in place, what is it? If you're saying it's not that, well, what is it? Well, uh, the, the model that, is in, that will be in place over those years is the comparability model subject to a reconciliation yes. and, and will with that PCID. On? Okay, that is the model that is in place between now uh, and the review for the transitional period. Uh, beyond that, there is genuinely no prejudice, no preconception of which model will be used beyond that. That is the purpose of the independent uh, uh, report uh, and the review process which both governments right. will do in so, those sorry, years. Sorry, I clearly I cannot understand why the Se Chief Secretary of Treasury can't answer a, a, an absolutely straightforward question of what would happen in the event of a new agreement being reached at that point. Well, let's see if Alec Johnson can get there and they'll come to Mark McDonald. I, I was just going to say that uh, my view is that the position that's been put forward by Stuart Maxwell would surely be a position which would allow whichever side uh, felt themselves to be uh, in a position of strength by not agreeing uh, 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 at that point five years in the future, would simply use the opportunity to default in the negotiations uh, to the position that benefited them. So surely if there is going to be serious negotiation and a serious settlement, then it is essential that we keep the area beyond that blank and do not commit to any default position as suggested by Stuart Maxwell. Well, I, I, think, I think that is, again, a, a, a reasonable point of view uh, uh, um, put forward, and that is why we've agreed uh, no prejudice on the model. The other thing I would say, uh, uh, Mr Crawford, is that I think, given the fact both governments will commission the uh, independent review, and by definition will be happy with that process, because A, that's a, what we've agreed now, and B, that will be the process which will be agreed when we set up this independent review, in the, when, we, when the independent review is established in the year 2021. 20, I think it would be very hard for either government uh, to go against the centrality and the substance of that independent review. Now, there may be, and without in any way trying to uh, speculate how this independent review might happen, uh, there may be one or two things where the two governments will sit that round and discuss. But in terms of the centrality of the recommendations, I think it would be very hard for either of the governments, given the fact that independent review will have the confidence of the two governments, will be based on real-life experience over five years, for either of the two governments to say, I'm going to completely ignore the independent review, and instead I'm going to carry on in one way or the other, or impose something one way or the other, I think would be extremely difficult. And that's why I've got really confidence in the ability of the two governments, because we've done it before, we've done it time and again, to find agreements in these spaces and move forward on that basis. Do, do you inter interpret the agreement as meaning that nothing will happen until the review process kicks in? Or do you perceive the situation being one in which that a common view may emerge in the intervening five years? Well, uh, in terms of whether the fiscal framework could be changed, uh, well, I think if uh, both governments thought there were serious issues and both governments came to an agreement, uh, then I don't see why not that there should not be the ability to uh, e effectively in some way or another temper the effects. Convener, I'm keen for this not to feel too much like Groundhog Day, so um, I just want to wind back ever so slightly. Um, you mentioned both at Finance Committee and here that the Treasury went in with a position that met the, uh, the, the recommendations of the Smith Commission. But your model has been adjusted um, to give effect to that which the Scottish Government wanted. And you're still telling us that the outcome meets the recommendation of the Smith Commission. I'm just wondering how those two positions can possibly be reconciled. Yeah, well, let, let me try and deal with that, because um, um, the uh, Smith principles, as laid out in, uh, particularly in uh, paragraph 95, 94 and 95, um, ha have been, are, are subject to differing interpretations. Uh, in my view, the Smith principles are clear. 
Um, but nevertheless, again, this is a, a negotiation between two governments and compromises uh, get made. Uh, and uh, the funding model is essentially a compromise uh, between the two governments. Uh, both of us think that it, uh, it fulfills Smith uh, um, and both of us uh, uh, think that we can defend uh, the model, the arrangements, the fiscal framework that has been signed and agreed. Okay. I just want to go back to the, the, the point that Alec Johnson was making there, which I think is, um, I find difficult to fathom in the sense that right as, as we discussed this at finance right now um, if we were in a position where there was no agreement the simple fact is is that the Scottish government would be placing a legis would be placing a recommendation that we do not agree a legislative consent motion six years hence from now um, we will be in a position where powers will have been uh, in place will have been exercised uh, people will be receiving welfare payments etc so we cannot have a situation where uh, there is essentially a, a void at the end of that process. Now, what we're not saying, uh, and I don't think the questioning from Stuart Maxwell or from myself this morning at Finance was about saying what happens after the review. We're not looking for that because the review will take place. What we're pointing out is, is that there is a, a perfectly legitimate hypothetical scenario in which the governments are unable to come to an agreement after the outcome of that review. And what we need to have some assurance of is, is that there will be something in place post March 2022, during which time undoubtedly negotiations will continue. But the point is, is that for those individuals who are relying on receipt of benefit or uh, other services or payment of taxation, which is underpinned by the fiscal framework, they need to have confidence and assurance that there will be something in place beyond 2022. And so all we're asking is, is that if at that point in 2022 there needs to be ongoing negotiation, but there has to be something in place, is it simply that the transitional model would continue for that period until such time as an agreement could be arrived at? Well, there's, uh, again, I say, uh, Ms Crawford, there would be no prejudice uh, on the use of the model going into that uh, uh, independent uh, review uh, uh, process. And both governments are satisfied with the arrangements that we've signed up to in the fiscal uh, framework. If, if, if you will forgive me, you're conflating two different things here. What I'm not, I, I, let, let's park the, the issue of what the review comes up with, right? In terms of any, you know, I appreciate no prejudice, it's for the review to determine. But the point is, is that if there is disagreement on what the review comes up with that cannot be resolved in time for the end of March 2022, something has to be there as a continuation, right. as a bridging mechanism in order to ensure that the fiscal framework can continue, the powers can continue to be exercised until such time as whatever the outcome of the review is, results in an agreement between the governments. So I'm not asking you to prejudice the review or the outcome of the review or anything like that. I'm simply asking you to confirm to us that in that instance, there would be something in place and, and would that something be the continuation of the transitional model, which is what the Deputy First Minister has said is his interpretation of what would happen. No, uh, well, um, okay, I mean, I, it is clear that there'll be, uh, there, there will be no default model uh, there'll be no prejudice going into that process. Uh, and the independent re mm. reporter, followed by the review, that process is also clear, written into the agreement. Right, I'm not, and this I'm is the agreement about, signed up by I'm both not, governments. I'm not asking about the independent review, okay? Mark, I'm not asking about the independent review. I'm just asking about what's But I think the independent Mark, review is a crucial part of that process, though. Okay. I think we're we're, going in that area, I think we've, we've got as far as we can. Listen, I just want to ask a couple of questions, just about some of the detail hmm. that, about the the independent advisor process. Uh, I'm, we're assuming, because um, from, from what we've heard so far, Chief Secretary, that however these independent advisors, whatever the body is, however it's made up, that that'll be agreed jointly between the Treasury and the Scottish Government. Um, and I also asked the, the Deputy First Minister on that area again at the review on the independent report when it's published so that the Parliament here has a chance to examine its detail and scrutinise it at the appropriate time as it's published. Um, and both governments get a copy, uh, can we have some assurance that the Parliament will get a copy at that time as well? Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Ms. Crawford, can you repeat uh, the... As, as the as w when the independent report is produced, which will go to both governments to enable Parliament here to scrutinise it properly, will the Parliament here be provided with a, a copy of that independent report at the same time as the governments? Uh, can I, know, I... I know it's looking okay. a bit further forward, but it's quite yeah. important to us. So. 
Josh, uh, can, I, uh, can I write you on that? I, yeah, I, it's kind of sure. slightly difficult for me to predict, because obviously the two governments in the future would have to agree the basis of the independent review and the report. Uh, and I don't want to yeah. in any way prejudice the procedure that might be used by future governments in terms of what they would do with that report. But can I just uh, think about that and write to you on that? Yeah, yeah particularly when, you know, if it's going to be published, then obviously in these circumstances, the, the, if you take that into account and you write to us, that would be helpful. Malcolm, I think you had some questions. Yeah, I wanted to go into the spillover effects, but can I just say, I mean, as someone who congratulated the Scottish Government at First Minister's Questions last, year for the, uh, last week for their part in this, can I thank the UK Government for being willing to move from some of its original positions, and I think being part to, to a document which is in many ways very impressive. I, I suppose the one area I wanted to home in on where I, I thought it might benefit from more clarity and perhaps less ambiguity is in relation to the spillover effects, and, and just two brief Quotes, uh, Professor Muscatelli says the main issue be, will, will be whether the two governments will always agree what a direct effect is and what a behavioural effect is or what material represents in the context of behavioural effects. And then David Phillips, as you know from the IFS, along with the two David professors at Stirling, says the agreement provides no indication as to what level of financial spillover effect might be considered material. So this will be entirely a matter for each government to decide on a case-by-case basis this could open the door to further dispute. So I think in the next five years, it seems to me this may be one area where there is uh, the most um, likelihood of some uh, disagreement. So I just wondered if you could give any more uh, detail about what these terms, direct behavioural material, and indeed there's a reference to other second hand as well in the uh, fiscal framework. Uh, um, um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chisholm. Let me try and uh, explain um, the three kinds of effects. There are the direct effects, um, the behavioural and what are called the second round effects. The second round effects will be entirely um, discounted, which, if you like, are uh, purely speculative as to uh, connecting different things that may have no causality between them at all. Uh, the direct effects is pretty clear. This is where, uh, for example, one government or the other were to change something like, say, a welfare, a devolved uh, a benefit in, in Scotland that would have an impact on a reserved benefit run by the UK government uh, or on a reserved tax run by the UK government, etc. So where that would be you know, predictable, uh, easily quantifiable and so on, those are the direct effects which will definitely come under uh, the agreement on spillover effects. Okay, so the, the questions really revolve around the behavioural impact. And here, I'm clear, and I think uh, John Swinney is clear as well, that what we're talking about here is something which will be generally pretty exceptional uh, and likely to have been unforeseen, uh, because at the end of the day, we do want to have uh, an element of uh, flexibility. You know, we do want to have the ability of the Scottish Government to set its own tax rates. That, if you like, is the purpose behind income tax devolution. So we want to make sure that the, um, that the behavioural impact uh, is not something uh, which will effectively negate the purpose of doing the tax devolution in the first place. So if the Scottish Government were to make a decision on tax, which would have an impact in the rest of the UK, uh, we would in no way want to prevent that happening merely because it might have a behavioural impact. So I think this would be used in exceptional cases. It would need to be shown that it's a material impact as well. Uh, and then we would use an appropriate mechanism to deal with it, but would have to be agreed by the two governments. So it is, if you like, a kind of a backstop position um, to look at something uh, which perhaps had not been foreseen uh, as a way of the two governments assessing that impact. But uh, again, I see this being used in, in fairly exceptional cases. Would you, would you be able or, or would you like to give an example of where it might be used? Well, it's difficult to, um, to speculate, but I think it would be something where it's got to be both material um, and it's got to have been um, exceptional and probably unforeseen. Um, it's difficult to speculate on what might be an unforeseen impact um, because by definition it's unforeseen. Um, Rob Gibson, I think you had some questions. Indeed I do, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chief Secretary. Um, the Joint Exchequer Committee has been very busy, but uh, it's going to have new uh, powers to take forward matters relating to the fiscal framework. Um, 
Sam H, the Scottish Association of Mental Health, were concerned that uh, she said were, they are pleased to have reached an agreement and that the powers agreed through the Scotland Bill can now be devolved according to the proposed timetable. So the question about welfare and uh, the way in which that will work out uh, is something which they are keen to uh, see that the framework uh, will work. Um, are there agreed terms of reference for the operation of the JEC? Two, two seconds. Okay. Can you to the Chief Secretary what Sam Yeah, I said we... that the Scottish Association of Mental, for M Mental Health. It's just a, a paper we've received from them, and they're very keen to see that the proposed timetable <coughs> for the devolution process works out. I'll, I'll just say, just say an initial uh, re remark, Mr. Gibbs, because I, I jointly chair that committee along yep. with currently uh, with Alec Neil. It's been agreed that that committee would be the conduit uh, through which the, uh, the decisions in relation to timing uh, of uh, welfare devolution uh, will take place. The committee does have terms of, of, of reference which are available uh, if you don't already uh, have them, and I, I, I'll share with so them. The but but I, I think, as you allude to, there, there will be there'll need to be some uh, enhancement of those terms. I, uh, I, I'm committed to you know the transparency uh, of that uh, process, and I think, as I said in my remarks last uh, week, uh, I mean what both governments are absolutely agreed to is that the prime concern relates with the end user in relation to the welfare changes and that we can't have a process that in any way prejudices the end user or leaves the end user uh, between the two governments. And, and we're absolutely clear that that, that, that sure. will be what determines it. From our perspective, there isn't any impediment on a time scale, uh, but it will be an agreed uh, time scale. What I should also say, I think it's worth putting on the record, is that there have been very, very extensive engagement between officials in the two governments on these areas. There's been secondments from the UK government into the Scottish government. And at that official level, this process is working extremely uh, well. I welcomed Mr Neill's announcement uh, this week, but obviously we've got a long way to go in understanding further detail of what yep. measures might be brought forward and therefore what the transitional measures will require to be. So in the terms of reference are available, that's fine. Um, what about the outcomes of any meetings of the JEC? Are they going to be made available? At, a, uh, I, I mean, I, at the moment, that, that's not the case because it is a ministerial a, a group. I, I'm quite happy to commit, you know, to engage with a, uh, the... Uh, which we have done, in fact, because uh, Mr. Neil and I, uh, with the third sector in Scotland, because Mr. Neil and I uh, co-chaired uh, or co-met, uh, however one wants to put it, a, um, following one of the, 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 the meetings here in the Scottish Parliament with various representatives from the third sector in Scotland. And I think that we would want to make sure that liaison with the third sector in Scotland uh, and other representatives and end users you know, was a part of the process that we followed. So in order to scrutinise what this uh, does, uh, Mr Mundell, um, you know, the idea of having some idea of what the outcomes of these meetings are would be helpful to the Parliament. Well, I, I think uh, bo both, both Mr Neil, uh, Ms Cunningham and, and Mr Swinney, who are the Scottish, Parliament uh, Scottish Government representatives, you know, have, I think, been available before committees uh, in the Parliament. Uh, I'm quite happy and, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, continue to, to, you know, to make myself available to this Parliament in relation uh, to the work of the, uh, in relation to the work of that uh, committee. Thank you for that. The agreement uh, notes on an ongoing role for the JEC in overseeing the fiscal framework. Is a similar ongoing role envisaged for the Joint <coughs> Ministerial Working Group on Welfare? Uh, beyond the implementation phase? I think that, that uh, we would want, to, uh, I think, to, uh, and I don't want to preempt the, the work of the, you know, the de a decision of the group, but obviously where the, the powers which are being devolved does allow joint working on uh, reserve benefits, for example, and the topping up of, of benefits, I, I, I think there would myself be value in the continued existence of the group 
beyond uh, the simple implementation of the powers that will be devolved exclusively to the Scottish Parliament. But I stress that is, that is, my, that is my view. I don't know whether it, you know, it would be a view shared by uh, the Scottish Government, but I certainly think uh, that there would be a benefit of that ongoing uh, process because uh, what ha was agreed essentially in the Smith uh, Commission was that you know, certain parts of welfare would be a shared space yeah. uh, and would be a shared space uh, for a, an indefinite period. So does the UK government have uh, agreement that there should be terms of references uh, published for the joint ministerial working group? And will these be report, able to be reported to Parliament once they're published? And the ongoing business the, of there, the there, there, there are terms of reference, yep. as I've said now. Uh, what, what I can commit to do, and I'm happy to commit to do, is that our next, next meeting of a... Uh, the group, which will probably be within the next Scottish Parliament because of the period, to, to take that, that issue forward, because I think it's a perfectly legitimate issue, and that the revised, uh, you know, the revised terms would be published. Thank you for that. Okay. Malcolm, do you want to raise something on baseline adjustment? Then I'm going to go to um, Stuart McMillan. Yeah, just in terms of the, the baseline adjustment for the first year, my understanding is that will be based on the OBR predictions of tax for the year. 15, 16. So it's really just to ask when, when will the real tax receipts, uh, when are they published? When would they be published uh, in terms of, because um, that will become the baseline, presumably will become the actual tax receipts. But in terms of the first year tax adjustments, so it will be based on the OBR's predictions for 2015, 16. Is that right? Uh, well, it would depend on which tax, because the income tax, ta income tax, sorry, income but tax, income tax yeah. will be done on the outturn. Uh, will be what, what it's going to be uh, done on. We'll be uh, looking back at the outturn of the year before devolution. 15-16. Uh, which will yep, be, yep. well, it will yep. be effective. Devolution, yep. according to the agreement, will be effective yep. in April 2017. Yeah, but in terms of 17-18, it will only be the predictions for 15-16 that can be used to work out the assumption about how much tax is used. Well, can I, uh, uh, can I just on that point, uh, uh, Mr Crawford, just get, uh, if I can write to the committee precisely, uh, I think it would be helpful given the different starting dates for the different taxes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if we just be absolutely clear uh, precisely when the baseline uh, will be assessed for each of those taxes. Uh, uh, because also, of course, VAT is also in turn different uh, because that will be done in the year 1920, sorry, 2019, 2020. Uh, in terms of uh, the VAT assignment. But in general terms for the block grant adjustment, after the first year it will, it will be done on the OBR predictions for the, for the relevant year, the actual year rather than the previous year. Well, can I, uh, I think if I write to the committee, okay. uh, Ms Crawford, that would be the, the right way to do that. Uh, Stuart Mill. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, just uh, what considerations led to the two governments to consider the £3 billion would be the sufficient borrowing cap? In terms of the capital borrowing cap, yes. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, Smith is uh, interesting in this regard, uh, Mr. Crawford, if I may through you, is um, Smith was uh, clear in uh, paragraph 95 in terms of the borrowing powers that there should be um, sufficient capital borrowing powers uh, and sufficient additional resource borrowing powers. And there the use of the word additional in relation to resource rather than capital uh, was very uh, distinctive uh, and uh, is a clear part of the agreement. Um, so actually, if one were to strictly interpret Smith, he doesn't mention anything about additional capital borrowing powers. Uh, but uh, in our willingness to uh, get an agreement and to uh, find something that both governments uh, can work with, we uh, did agree between the two governments to increase the capital borrowing limit, uh, which under the previous arrangements, i.e. the Scotland Act 2012, of 2.2 billion, to increase that to 3 billion, uh, and also to increase the amount that could be uh, borrowed in, in each year from having been previously 10% of CDEL uh, to be 15% of the limit. Uh, so this would be a £450 million uh, uh, annual borrowing power, so long as you don't exceed the overall £3 billion limit, uh, which I think will make a significant difference. Uh, and by the way, the Scottish Government already has a generous uh, CDEL uh, settlement over the spending review period, up significantly in the previous spending review period, I think 14% higher. Um, so there's a lot of generosity there, and I would look forward to seeing 
um, the Scottish Government uh, deploying that generosity well in terms of capital projects, infrastructure projects in Scotland that will make a real difference to the Scottish economy. And I really look forward to seeing that happening. It showed quite clearly in Scotland infrastructure spend was ahead in Scotland and public sector spending in that area than any other part of the UK in comparison per head of population, just as a matter of interest. Stuart, you got any other questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so why did the, the two governments decide not to opt for the, a prudential regime uh, for capital borrowing? Yeah, well, again, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and it, Smith was clear that a prudential borrowing regime should be considered, uh, although Smith did not necessarily recommend that it should be adopted. Um, so we did consider that. We did look at it. We did discuss it. But both governments were satisfied, content to uh, adopt the arrangements that we've made, which is an increase in the borrowing uh, based on the existing arrangements. Uh, and finally, I, mean, I posed a question to the Deputy First Minister this morning, uh, and uh, sort of a similar question to yourselves. Uh, certainly in terms of paragraph 57 uh, of the, the fiscal uh, framework and also paragraph 73 to 76, particularly paragraph 74, regarding the payments uh, made to the capital reserve. Uh, can you confirm that uh, as a result of this fiscal framework that the UK government will pay their previously agreed contributions to the city deal projects in Scotland and not expect the Scottish government to contribute more now that there actually are greater borrowing powers to come to this parliament? Uh, sorry, in terms of city, future city deals? Well, the yeah. current, and, uh, current and proposed okay, well, city deal projects. Uh, uh, city deals are always uh, uh, bespoke, uh, and I think it would be difficult to predict in advance exactly how the city deals uh, would be financed. But the UK government, as you know, is committed to delivering these city deals, has got a very, very good record. Uh, in terms of the city deals done uh, for Glasgow uh, and in Aberdeen uh, earlier this year, back in January, uh, when the Prime Minister came up, um, so uh, um, I, I think one should have confidence in our ability to deliver those city deals, uh, um, and I think they've been a big success. Well, but I'm seeking confirmation that, uh, that but as a result of this new uh, fiscal framework that the, and the powers that this Parliament uh, will now have, that, uh, that, uh, that the UK Government will not um, reduce their contribution to the city deal projects because of expecting the Scottish Government to then pick up that, uh, that shortfall. I'm aware of any reason why that would be the case going forward, that any funding for city deals should be affected uh, by the fiscal framework. I, I, okay. I, can't, I can't foresee any reason. Okay, move thank on. you. Can we, can we move on from that? Linda, I think you've got a question. I've got a couple, uh, couple of questions um, for, for the Chief Secretary. It was very clear, Chief Secretary, during the, the Smith Commission itself, that all parties involved. Um, felt very strongly that both governments were of equal status in any negotiations uh, that went on. And I would just uh, appreciate your view on that in terms of um, how the negotiations went to reach the agreement that we now have and how that will carry on in the future. Well, I, I thank uh, Mr Fabiani for that question. And uh, yes, we've been uh, scrupulous in ensuring equal status in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost without exception, uh, we've alternated the venue um, for the meetings uh, between Edinburgh and London. Uh, we've alternated the chair of the particular uh, Joint Exchequer Committee meeting. Um, the papers that have been produced have either been joint papers or Scottish Government papers or UK Government papers. Uh, and the officials have worked uh, uh, very well together in a, in a good spirit, in a good collaborative way. Uh, again, on the basis of uh, parity of esteem uh, between mm -hmm. the two governments. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that has worked well. I'm looking forward to working uh, in the future uh, with John Swinney uh, on the same basis. Um, that, uh, uh, you know, I've been to, I spent quite a bit of time in Edinburgh over the last year. I think this is my uh, fifth visit uh, today. Uh, I know he's down in London quite a bit, and I would expect that to continue on that basis. Okay, thank you. In relation to that, there's two issues I'd like to bring up. One of them, you mentioned papers. Uh, in that, there is parity of esteem. Although uh, Mr Swinney was um, fairly diplomatic today in how he talked about publication of papers, I seem to remember my impression is that last week he expressed um, positivity about giving papers to this committee to scrutinise. And you quite clearly today have said that, that you wouldn't like to do that. Um, is that something that uh, could be discussed now by your respective teams in that there is 
parity of esteem and in, in views, and perhaps we can reach a compromise. I, I think, if I may, I think that's a slightly different question to parity of esteem. I think here to release the uh, papers, the, the confidential discussion papers, would need agreement between both governments, or should have agreement between both governments, and I don't think that's uh, in any way reflects on the parity of esteem between the two governments. I think okay. an intergovernmental negotiation, uh, um, both governments by definition should agree. Okay, um, on another aspect that I would say um, is fairly similar, um, I think I'm remembering rightly that the First Minister, in fact, was quite clear in something she said in the Chamber about her view being that the default position um, at review time was the status quo, which would be what was happening there and absolutely no detriment to Scotland. Um, so again, would you agree that that view and your own view of there being no default position um, are both equally valid? Well, uh, I think it's up to... Uh, the most important thing is what is in the agreement. Uh, and it really is up to uh, um, um, both sides to justify um, their statements in their respective parliaments. Um, so in that sense, there is an equality. We all have to justify uh, what we say, and we all have to abide by what's in the agreement. All right. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Secretary of State a quick question? Um, please, convener. Hi. Um, it was just, can I say, first of all, I very much appreciated the, the attachment, Secretary of State, that you gave with your letter, an interesting reading. Um, but what I would also appreciate um, is um, some dates put on what you explained to us at the beginning in your statement about the process through the House of Commons um, and really just confirmation that the Scotland Bill will go through before um, dissolution of this Parliament, assuming, of course, that le the legislative consent motion goes through this Parliament. Well, I, I, as, as you would appreciate, uh, Ms. Fabiani, what, the one thing which I did not want <clears throat> to do in my opening remarks was to preempt the report of this yes. committee or uh, you know, the sitting schedule of, of this parliament. My understanding from informal sources was that po possibly the debate on, on this uh, LCM might take place around about the 17th of, of March. If that was the date, then I would be hopeful uh, that we would be able to uh, complete uh, the House of Commons stages of the following week. But uh -huh. I am not, I am not, and I make it very clear, uh -huh. I am not in control of the House of Commons timetable. And, uh, you know, I will hear from uh, whips and you know, Mr. Crawford's previously uh, been in, in this role in this uh, parliament that it is not for ministers to set the timetable <laughs> of parliaments. But it, it is certainly my endeavour uh, if that was the timetable you were operating to and if the parliament chose to pass the LCM that we would seek to do everything possible to complete these two outstanding stages of the bill uh, prior uh, to the beginning of the Purda period. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I, I always found that force of personality can always achieve much more than you sometimes expect in these circumstances. Uh, can, I, can I thank the, the Secretary of State and the Chief Secretary for coming and giving evidence to this morning? Uh, I, I now close this session of the, 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 this uh, particular <coughs> meeting. We don't have time to go into item number two. So thank you very much. We, the committee is now closed. <laughs>